Good afternoon and welcome to the September 25th, 2017 meeting of the Orlando City Council. We're going to begin today's proceedings with the invocation offered today by Pastor Zach Van Dyke and followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Tony Ortiz. Pastor Van, Van Dyke is a teaching pastor at Summit Church Herndon Campus since 2014. Summit is a non-denominational Christian church founded 15 years ago by three Orlando natives. Summit's congregation regularly disperses throughout Central Florida to serve alongside organizations that are crucial to our city. The day after the Pulse tragedy, Summit assembled a thousand care packages for family members and first responders. Pastor Van Dyke married his fifth grade school girlfriend and together they have five children. After the invocation, Commissioner Ortiz will lead us in the um, Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor Van Dyke, before you do the uh, invocation, I understand that your five children are named after literary characters, one being Atticus. Could you give us the other ones before we stand? Yeah, I've got Oliver, Atticus, Alice, Pren, which is after Hester Pren from uh, um, the Scarlet Letter, and then Huck is the baby. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I just want to say I love our city, and I'm so thankful for what you all do. And as I was thinking about what I would like to pray uh, for you all in particular, I couldn't help but think of the story found in the Gospel of John where Jesus is celebrating the Jewish Passover uh, with his friends. And at the end of that meal, he gets down and it says he gets on his knees and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And so my prayer for our city is that it would be full of leaders who are willing to lead in that kind of way, in a way that says, I will get down in the dirt and clean up. Um, and so that's my prayer for you all. If you would like uh, to bow your head, I would love to pray for you all. Our Father who art in heaven, Thanks for loving us. Thanks for loving us in spite of our mistakes and our brokenness and the times we lack humility. In your great love for us, give us the kind of humility that can free us to truly serve one another. Thank you for designing us to need each other, for making us not independent but dependent creatures. Thanks for the God-given dependence we all have and for meeting our needs often through one another. Thank you for giving us work to do that matters work that brings about human flourishing. Help us see ways we can take part in that kind of work. You tell us in the scriptures that we are to obey those who govern because you have established them to promote peace and order and justice for all. Father God, bless our mayor and our city officials. Bless all those who serve the people of Orlando. Thank you for giving them to us. Graciously give them wisdom to govern in a way that is good for all people of our city. Graciously give them insight into the true needs of the people of our city, especially those who are most vulnerable to poverty and oppression and injustice. Graciously give them patience to work together in harmony, even in the midst of varying opinions. May all present here humbly serve one another as they make both important and seemingly small decisions. And Father God, graciously give them courage and bravery to take whatever steps are necessary to make our city the true city beautiful. And Father God, lastly, I also pray for their families. I pray you protect their relationship with their families and loved ones. As they sacrifice so much for so many, may they not lose sight of the gift you have given them and the ones closest to them. And I pray all these things thankful that you are a God of grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll and make a determination of a quorum, please? Commissioner Gray. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. Commissioner Stewart. Here. Commissioner Sheehan. Here. Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Ings. Here. Mayor Dyer. Here. Mayor Dyer, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, our first order of business is consideration of the minutes from the agenda review and city council so meetings of September second. 6th. Uh, motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Hill. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 
Those opposed, and so the motion carries. We're right into awards and presentations. So the first one I'm going to call on Marcia for, um, the big anniversary date coming on, and a special surprise for City Council. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be with you always. And uh, you may or may not know that the mission of the Orlando Philharmonic uh, orchestra is to foster and promote symphonic music through excellence in performance, education, and cultural leadership. And it, they truly do that in the city of Orlando. And this is a very exciting time, as Mayor Dyer mentioned, because it is their 25th anniversary season. And we're fortunate today because we do have a special presentation. And after the presentation, Mayor and Commissioners, Christopher Barton, the Executive Director of the Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra, will speak to you and give you a brief overview. But before that, you have a treat in the performance of the Sovereign Brass Fanfare. <laughs> Mayor Dyer and City Commissioners, thank you for your service to our city and for the opportunity to be here today. Along with our wonderful musicians, I am pleased to be joined by R.K. Kelly, President of our Board of Directors, and Eric Jacobson, our Music Director, along with members of our staff. The Orlando Philharmonic is proud to be Central Florida's professional orchestra, and the celebration of our 25th anniversary season gives us the unique opportunity to honor our past and celebrate the future. Thank you, Mayor Dyer for serving as one of our honorary co-chairs for this occasion. We are very excited about an incredible season ahead. Our concerts this weekend at the Bob Carr Theater open with Fanfare Orlando for Brass Ensemble, a piece written specifically for this occasion by composer Keith Lay of Valencia College. And then with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and the Ode to Joy sung by the UCF Chorus, we are privileged to perform one of the most grand and unifying works of art that any community can experience together. Through one of the largest partnerships in the nation between an orchestra and public school systems, more than 65,000 students will experience our young people's concerts this year. 
And as we were counting backwards to our founding days, we realized that in this anniversary year, we will serve our one millionth student through this program. <laughs> On May 8th of next year, we end our season with a 25th anniversary gala concert featuring the world's most celebrated cellist and classical musician, Yo-Yo Ma, in his first Central Florida appearance, along with violinist Colin Jacobson, who happens to be Eric's brother. For us, this will be more than a concert with a world-renowned soloist. We see it as an achievement, a true artistic milestone for this community, and an example of the ambitious vision of both this city and its orchestra. And as we look to the future, the construction of Steinmetz Hall, underway across the street at the Dr. Phillips Center, is the promise of a glorious acoustic hall being realized. We look forward with great anticipation to its opening in 2020. The future of Orlando is exciting, and the leadership of our organization, our board of directors, musicians, staff, and volunteers, all are dedicated to continuing our legacy of artistic excellence and passionate commitment to our community for 25 years more and beyond. Thank you for allowing us to make the city beautiful that much more by sharing our music. Thank you so much, and I have a uh, proclamation to read. Whereas the mission of the Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra is to enrich, inspire, and transform the diverse communities of Central Florida through the power of live music, and whereas for 25 years the Philharmonic has committed to fostering the joy and the wide-ranging benefits of music performance and arts education for all ages. The orchestra seeks to stimulate growth and learning through music across the entire community. And whereas the Philharmonic believes that a performance stage is defined by the enthusiasm and quality of the performance, therefore the Phil performs in hospitals, schools, parks, and on stages of all kinds in order to enrich and connect with the community. And whereas the Philharmonic's musicians are the heart of the organization, and as artists residents seek to serve, encourage, and nurture the community with great music performed with the highest degree of professionalism and artistic excellence, and whereas a city for everyone, Orlando has a long history of establishing partnerships which have supported the development of programs and organizations that are built on the foundation of compassion and that foster compassion in our city. Now, therefore, I, Buddy Dyer, Mayor of the City of Orlando, hereby do proclaim September 25th, 2017 as Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra 25th Anniversary Day in the City of Orlando. Why don't you bring the guys back and we'll do a picture down here and pull your green tags off as you go. Thanks. <laughs> if, if Jeff, the trombone player, and I had this skirmish, but everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our other presentation, I'd li like to ask Chief Mina to introduce. Good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. Uh, October is Domestic Violence uh, Awareness Month, and there may be some cities and police departments um, that would prefer not to talk about domestic violence, and we are not one of them. We pride ourselves on our responsiveness uh, to this crime in all forms, and we're constantly working to identify victims in those high lethality situations so that we and our partners uh, can intervene before the tragedy strikes. We also recognize how domestic violence affects society, fractures families, 
and deprives youth of well-deserved opportunities. Every officer and employee of the Orlando Police Department knows the knows that as an organization, our core values include the protection of domestic violence survivors and holding their abusers accountable. The Orlando Police Department works tirelessly to reduce crime and make safe and livable neighborhoods, and none of this would be possible without the invaluable service of the victim service partners that we have here with us today. Many of them are in purple. Um, permit me to introduce uh, Michelle Spurzel, the CEO of Central Florida um, Harbor House. Thank you, Chief Mina. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to really talk about domestic violence. It's a very important social issue. And what I've noticed coming that I'm new here to the Orlando area is that this city, the city officials, mayor, chief, everybody is so committed to really working with survivors of domestic violence and holding perpetrators accountable. So thank you very, very much for the work that you're doing for the ongoing partnership. And it's a beautiful partnership to be able to walk into. And I look forward to getting to know all of you more as I get to know the city more and as we move forward to making it safe for survivors. And I do have a City of Orlando proclamation. Whereas one in every three women will experience domestic violence during her lifetime, and whereas victims should have help to find the compassion, comfort, and healing they need, and domestic abusers should be punished to the full extent of the law, and whereas families are indispensable to a stable society and they should be a place of support to instill responsibility and values in the next generation, and whereas fleeing domestic violence has caused women and children to be the fastest growing homeless population, and whereas powerful partnerships exist between the City of Orlando Police Department, Harbor House of Central Florida, the State of Florida Department of Children and Families, the Howard Phillips Center for Children and Families, and the Victim Service Center of Central Florida, and whereas the President of the United States States and Congress, as well as other federal agencies, have expressed their commitment to eliminating domestic violence, both nationally and internationally. Now, therefore, I, Buddy Dyer, Mayor of the City of Orlando, hereby do proclaim October 17th as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the City of Orlando. Okay, before I go into the mayor's update, I would like to remind everybody, since I did hear somebody's phone going off, to silence your phones or put them on vibrate. And then secondly, I have a feeling there's a lot of students here today because there are faces that I don't recognize in the audience. So if you are a student um, and have been forced to come to this meeting <laughs> or voluntarily came to this meeting, either one, if you'd stand, we'd like to recognize you. Uh, everybody from Valencia or other places? <laughs> Valencia. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. I'm going to go into the mayor's update, and I want to start with um, the recent um, storm that we had, Hurricane Irma. And like Hurricane Charlie, it was one of those unpredictable storms. Um, 
it was unique in the size and the severity and that it impacted virtually every part of the state of Florida. And right up to the last minute, we had no idea where it was coming. We knew it was going to hit South Florida at some point, but for a couple of days, we thought it was going to come up the East Coast. Then we thought it was going to come up through the middle of the state of Florida. Then at the very end, it looked like it was going to go up the West Coast. And then it surprised us again and came in down near Naples and um, headed directly just east, just west of Orlando. So we got the northeast quadrant, which is not the quadrant you really want to have. But I couldn't be more proud of how our community responded first by heeding all the uh, recommendations and warning on how to behave and prepare for the storm and how to act during the storm. And then after the storm, the outpouring of neighbor helping neighbor um, all over the city. The very first day I saw people that were out cleaning other people's yards. And even as I went out to do what I needed to do on that day, I came home and my neighbors had cleaned up my yard. So I was very thankful for that. But uh, it's just what Orlando is all about in terms of being a community and taking pride in helping each other. And then the city employees, I want to thank so much from OPD to OFD, uh, the first responders. But turned out on the next day, the first responders were really public works and parks and rec as we sought to clear the streets and reestablish uh, um, traffic signals and stop signs and everybody was working around the clock to get us back in good shape. I want to thank OUC and all of the linemen that came from all over the country. I had an opportunity to um, visit with a lot of them and I went to a couple of the meals that they serve for them and OUC has a really uh, good operation in terms of putting those men and women into the field. But there were people that I met from Michigan, from Kansas, uh, from s several states in the Northeast. So there were linemen that came from everywhere. And some of them had recently been in Houston and in Texas and had come directly from Texas uh, on to Florida. So um, kudos to them. And I think just about everybody within the city limits of Orlando had their power restored by Friday. And OUC did a good job of letting people know when they were likely to get their power restored. And just for the record, I had power off through the storm, and then it went off at about 10 o'clock Monday morning, mm -hmm. and wasn't restored till Wednesday evening. So even the mayor can go 48 <laughs> hours or so without power, um, but all is good. And I know that um, there are so many selfless acts that went on during the course of this. I'm just proud of everybody in Orlando and how they responded. I'm going to ask Manny to come up and kind of give us a report on all things Hurricane Irma. And then I'm going to call up the man that has all the answers that everybody wants right now, and that is Mike Carroll, who heads up our Solid Waste Division. Great. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Commissioner. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the um, Hurricane Irma response and recovery effort, starting off with the Emergency Operations Center activation. Um, the, um, we started issuing out the uh, Orlando advisory early on the Labor Day weekend. And on September 6th, we actually have issued our first ever uh, Orlando alert advisory using our new notification system. And we started our emergency management uh, team briefing on that Friday to ensure that all city staff uh, was prepared for the major impact. Uh, the, EOC went to a full level activation on September the 10th and it ran a level one all the way through um, the 16th. The EIC had an additional day. The Emergency Information Center or the Citizen Information Line ran operation to the 17th at evening hour. And then by the 17th, we were all disactivated. What I want to point out that during the time frame that the Emergency Operations Center was activated, we maintained line of communications with the National Hurricane Center, national at the state warning point, the um, National Weather Service out of uh, Melbourne, and we conducted approximately over 20 plus conference call webinar during that time frame of activation, just to make sure we were getting the most updated information and sharing that information across the entire spectrum. This is our emergency management team. Uh, we're structurally organized under the ESF model, which is a FEMA standard. Uh, every department in the city has a representation 
at the EOC using these uh, emergency support function. In addition to the city team that was there, we had representative from OUC, Orlando Utility Commission. We had Universal Studio Links, Orlando Health, Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, the Orange County Public School, and the Department of Homeland Security folks out of the airport. It was very imperative for us to maintain line of communication, but being able to share our information across these uh, different agencies throughout the uh, city. From an ESF uh, transportation, ESF-1 transportation perspective, there were approximately 400 stop signs and 475 signal units that needed to be looked at after the storm. Uh, as of Friday, uh, all but one traffic center was fully operational, and we maintained that momentum. The ESF-2, the information technology, uh, provided superb support to our network, our telecom, and making sure that we're able to do what we're able to conduct from the Emergency Operations Center. As you know, the uh, Emergency Operations Center is the nerve center, so it's very critical for us to maintain the connectivity necessary to run operation. Uh, our public work and our family parks recreation uh, was very critical in uh, providing support prior to the event, during the event, and after the event, public work, and I know that Mike Carroll's gonna talk a bit more about this later on. Uh, provided over 38,000 sandbags uh, prior to the hurricane. Uh, they maintain over uh, 125 out of 230 lift station lost power, but they're all back online today. And Family Parks and Rec uh, conducted a cleanup of 116 parks and during and post after the, after the storm had 11 neighborhood centers that maintain uh, free shower care in support of the response effort. Uh, the ongoing effort for public work efforts, 300,000 cubic yards of uh, debris, uh, vegetative debris that's, gonna, that's continuously being collected. Our ESF 4-8, our fire department, firefighting and EMS, uh, deployed to support the cleaning effort right after the storm. They assisted in distributing over uh, 5,000 uh, uh, water and 5,000 bags of ice during the, the event. And they also conducted health and welfare inspection at 145 nursing home and assisted living facility within the city. This was very vital to make sure that the most uh, vulnerable population was being sought after during and after the storm. And in addition to that, they conducted a barbecue at the Englewood Neighborhood Center, which I understand was a big, big uh, hit at that location with over 200, 300 people attending the event. Uh, from a mass care perspective, uh, all of you know that Orange County provides general shelter, special needs shelter, and pet friendly shelter within the community. Uh, but we also have a vulnerable population within the city, the uh, homeless shelter population. And with the efforts and coordination effort of uh, Laurie uh, Harris, we were able to provide assistance in tra transporting homeless to the shelter to ensure that when the storm hit, we had the largest amount of homeless away from the camps, away from the streets, in secure places, so we, don't, we could, wouldn't experience a fatality. Just want to point out that we had 109% full capacity at all these shelters, uh, homeless shelters throughout the city. Our Task Force 4, a part of our ESF-9 search and rescue team, uh, deployed to Ocala to support flooding events up in the Santa Fe River, up in the Panhandle during that time frame. Our communication team, very vital in supporting the message from the city coordinated the social media platform from the EOC and maintained the presence of making sure the communications was open to the citizens of Orlando to ensure that we had the most current and updated information, English and in Spanish, throughout the entire event, pre-storm, during the storm, and post-storm. And again, our ESF 15, our volunteer donation, our citizen information line, Activated from the 10th of September to the 17th, they had 58 city staff, city volunteers that supported this operation, and they took over 1,800 call during the time of activation. Our law enforcement partners, our ESF-16, again, assisted with downed trees, directed traffic, multiple intersections, over 100 intersections, and assisted in the refueling of uh, generators that were helped that helped the uh, traffic signaling units that were without power. Again, they assisted us in distributing 
ICE the resident without power, and they also hosted a big uh, community barbecue at Gilbert McQueen Park. Our ESF 18, our business and industry uh, department uh, session, uh, waived permit fee for hurricane related repairs in order to accelerate the uh, recovery efforts. And this is something that uh, uh, we have waived fees of 100 permits thus far. And our ESF 19 damage assessment conducted over 1,500 uh, damage assessment uh, within the city with an estimated value of $140 million as of 919. This does not include city property uh, as well. And then our ESF 20, our facility team, uh, generated approximately 169 work order to ensure that our facilities uh, were repaired after damages. And one of the things they did to ensure that city facilities were up and running during and after the storm is they monitor all critical system of all city facility to ensure that these buildings were ready to go once the storm was over. So that was something that they did remotely, ensuring that the city was ready to lean forward after the storm. One thing that I do want to say is that we're very proud of how the city resident re, uh, prepared for this particular event. They took the, the, uh, the threat very seriously and they prepared adequately to ensure that we're able to respond. And I'm also very proud of the fact that the city staff, the, all the departments engaged in this effort, pre-storm, during the storm, and post-storm were very critical and vital to ensure that we were able to respond and be able to uh, take care of the citizens uh, for Hurricane Irma. At this time, I'd like to present Mike Carroll. We go to Mike, any questions for Manny? We get a copy of the yes. report. I'll stay here. Hey, Manny, would you make sure that you electronically give uh, all the commissioners a copy of your PowerPoint? Yes, thank you. Mayor, commissioners, thank you. I'm told that clashes on television. <laughs> um, I thought for a little bit the Philharmonic was going to be my walk-up music, like it was my <laughs> turn to bat. The fanfare is your walk-up yes. music, Mike. <laughs> um, thank you for an opportunity to catch you all up, although we, I send out some updates and we've spoken a good bit, and you all have been great conduits to get me information about issues in the field. Um, this is a big job. Uh, Matt, to put it in perspective, um, Hurricane Matthew was just under 100,000 yards. This is about 300,000 yards. It is vastly more distributed. Um, and Hurricane Charlie, Francis, and Jean altogether was just a tad under a million cubic yards. So this is a pretty decent sized storm. We were lucky that it wasn't worse. We didn't have the major tree loss that we might have had. But almost everybody has a two to six yard pile in their front yard to pick up. Um, our customers have been outstanding in assisting us. Um, the city crews have been out there being respected and appreciated and quite frankly given a little bit of love from our customers as we've worked. To put this, that 300,000 yards into perspective, it is about four and a half times what we pick up on an average year of yard waste. It's important, as we started messaging right away from the Emergency Operations Center, to separate the waste into piles so that it can be dealt with best. Our leaves and small branches should be bagged and bundled. If they're bagged and bundled, they can be picked up by all CD crews. So our old-fashioned rear loaders that pick up yard waste every day, claw trucks can pick that up. It doubles to look at it as a resident, it doubles the opportunity, the number of city trucks that can pick up your waste. If you can bundle with duct tape or twine, works wonderful. If you have any building material damage that's shown in the right-hand side of that photograph, keep it separated from the vegetative debris. Our FEMA contractors, if you will, the ones following the FEMA rules that work for the city, are required by federal regulations to collect building materials and construction debris separately. Please don't put it in the road. It can block, it can make, become a travel hazard as the leaves come off, they'll wash down the drain, cause local, possibly cause localized flooding. Stack it neatly and don't be afraid to stack it up a little bit of height as long as you can safely see to back out of your driveway. 
Um, larger items, we're, we've activated three major debris contractors. Um, and they're having difficulty obtaining, as you've read in the paper, subcontractors to help them perform. There may be some reasons that the media talks about, but I think the two fundamental ones are pretty clear. This is the first time that two major storms have hit the mainland in one season. Charlie, Charlie was a major storm, Francis and Jean weren't. We have not had, this is the first time we've had it. In addition to that, they both hit massive population centers. The, great, the Louisiana, Texas border, including the nation's fourth largest city, along with the entire peninsula. Our attack going forward as these contractors ramp, oh, let me tell you that t this morning, 22 trucks rolled from our contractors to pick up. Last Friday, 11 rolled. We're starting to make progress. Um, the map that you see shows our yard waste areas, and that's how I can reference the work the city crews are doing. In the northwest, kind of an orange color, um, is our Monday yard waste area. The northeast, the bluish color, good pair right there, uh, is the Thursday yard waste area. The yellow is the Tuesday yard waste area in the far east and southeast. And then the green areas are the Wednesday area. Today we're picking up uh, bags and bundles in the Monday area, the northwest. Tomorrow we will be in the yellow area. Wednesday, the green area. And we followed this process each day and then Thursday into the, th the blue area with those bags and bundles. So those five or six routes, whatever, however many trucks we've got running, and we've staffed them all every day. We've worked seven days a week since Monday, since Tuesday the 12th. Then on Friday, we will come back to the last area we served and keep circling around the city in that process, picking up the hand items. This weekend, and for the next couple days, our claw trucks are out picking up the building materials that are separated out. That falls on the city more than the large vegetative debris. Contractors can pick that up. So we're going to pick up the fencing and the uh, carpet that was destroyed by flooding, et cetera. This is a four-step process. First step's called emergency push. That's happened. We've cleared the roads, pushed the debris, cut it up, and pushed it off to the sides. Now comes what I call A, B, and C. A, is to pick up the debris from the right of way. It can only be picked up by our, in, be reimbursable by FEMA from the public right of way. So private streets, gated communities, city crews can pick up there or they can handle it themselves. But our folks that are receiving, that will be reimbursed for, will, can only work in the public right of way. So first is picking it up, A. Then B is processing the debris and grinding it and reducing its size. That will happen in, in the subsequent weeks. And then the last part is the outhaul. We are going to provide three passes to every neighborhood. So folks who weren't able to get it out and we have picked up on their street, put it back out. We will be along a few weeks later. We'll make three full passes, making sure that we can pick up all the debris that, was, um, that this storm caused. We're following the FEMA public administration rules that uh, requires that separation. It can take the five to $10 million that this, it will cost to clean up after this storm and make it 75% reimbursable. We can pick up from the right of way, streets and parks. Right now we have crews working in the, in the Northwest, headed to that little blue um, star is a temporary disposal facility, a grinding facility on Mercy Drive. We are working in the southern part of Rosemont. We have picked up in the Willows and up off of Mercy Drive. We've picked up in the, in the Rock Lake area. Then the crews are working in the northern end of Paramore and are going north and east from there. That was our, one of our contractors. On the eastern side of town, there's a Orlando City dot or a star. And that is the facility off of Andes. We've got our newest contractors beginning to work there. Um, and our first contractor is expanding to split that disposal site in half. They will go east from there 
excuse me, west, headed into the area west of the Herndon Airport, and then south. Down near the First Baptist Church, right by I-4, our friends at the First Baptist Church let us use that large overflow lot, as they did after Hurricane Charlie. We thank them very much for that community spirit. One of the companies, our second disaster companies, begun working there. They're working in um, starting from out by Valencia College. There were some large piles beside the road, and then they're working their way east from there. So that would be your Richmond Heights, Carver Shores, Timberleaf type of thing. Although their trucks are very large, might not take those into Timberleaf. It would be tough to get through, but we'll use a, a smaller truck for that. And then we have crews starting just below, contractor crew, just below the East-West Expressway, just a little east of downtown, working south, and several tr crews in the southern city limits in that same part of town, working north. City crews have worked out in all parts of the city. We've picked up a good deal in Metro West. We've picked up a good deal in Vista East. We've picked up a good deal in the far, far southeast. Um, we've worked in Rosemont an awful lot. We've worked in Baldwin Park attacking a few issues. And then in the center part just north of Eola Park, we've made some good progress in there. This will be a storm this size without the conflicting storms should take us 21 to 30 days to make a first pass if we could have the resources of these contractors without the ex massive exposure in South Florida. It's going to be longer than that. I hesitate to make a prediction other than if we can continue to get growth in our contractor participation in subs, we can reduce the time and get closer to that 30-day pass. They can really make progress. I'm going to flick down to the far, far southeast. There's also an opportunity for a temporary debris site a little bit south and east of the Southport neighborhood if we can find an additional contractor to work for us. City trucks have worked uh, seven days a week, uh, and they've teamed up. It's been rather creative. The first day out, claw city, uh, solid waste claw trucks used their robotic arm to fill streets dump trucks. And now they're using bobcats and lo other loaders and working along rather nicely. Um, this, uh, what I've learned, this is only my fifth hurricane. But what I have learned is that this is a frustratingly slow process for the residents. Um, and it's a little bit frustrating for me too. The way I keep a cheerful disposition is that I get to drive around after Charlie, Francis, Gene, Matthew, Aaron, some of the tropical storms. And we, my crews take great pride in our efforts and how the city does get back to normal. There may be a few folks who lose a couple of squares of sod in the process. And we're going to have some inconveniences. But we're going to be as safe as we can. I'm going to address the critical issues. And, we're going to keep, and I'm going to keep chasing contractors until I fall asleep every night, and then I wake <laughs> up again at 4.30, and I call them again. I'm a little bit of a bulldog that way. I may seem mild-mannered here. How about some questions? Commissioner Hill, then Commissioner Stewart, then Commissioner Sheehan. I just want to, first of all, just say thank you, Mike, and your staff for your efforts uh, during this uh, time. I do have some questions uh, regarding the uh, opportunities for subcontractors. How would I go about getting that information uh, out to the I stopped one slide too soon. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Interested, can I start right now? Yeah. Yep. Interesting hauling firms can contact mm -hmm. our active degree disaster recovery contractors. Eric Hall of Crowder Gulf, that's his email. Okay. These folks are in the field all the time. They have cell phones, but by far the best way to contact them by email. Mark Stafford of DRC Emergency Services, they're our newest one. They've just got their first couple of trucks here to start working tomorrow morning. Uh, Fred Neris of Ashbridge Environmental, and his email is right there. They can also, of course, assist by bagging and bundling, and then using all the Orange County drop-off locations. It's a great opportunity. I'm sorry to, to remind everybody that every city resident is a county resident and so please let's use that part and um, and of course we're having up we'll have updates on our web page 
Yes, I, I guess Treasurer Hill, just I'm going to be sure. extremely impressed if you pop a new slide up for each question. <laughs> that was <laughs> impressive, Mike. It's my only one. And Michelle was probably going to hit me in the back of the head in a second for not going far enough. So, Commissioner Hill. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there any special uh, for the subcontractors, licensures, or permitting they have to get before they give these? Uh, it it might vary right for now. each one. But yeah, they, I mean, they have to be properly licensed. Right. Their equipment has to be properly inspected. They'll have to have a minimum amount of insurance. It may vary with each company. And so they'll be able to tell them right away what that is. If, one, if they don't have enough for one, they should contact another in case they vary, because they may. Um, they, their, equip, their trucks must be mechanically loaded. So that would be something like our claw trucks okay. or the little tractors called skid steer tractors or larger loaders that can pick up debris and put it in. FEMA stopped us after her, uh, everybody after Hurricane Charlie from loading trucks by hand. Really? Mm, okay. It's also kind of dangerous too and not real productive, but um, they felt that didn't allow for a good solid load. So the crew down there off of uh, Delaney, I guess it is, or near Delaney, is using a small bobcat tractor, okay. mm -hmm. loading it up. So fo that sort of thing is very helpful. Okay. There are also opportunities for people who have large transport trucks semi-size mm -hmm. for part C, the outhaul. So these okay. folks would be interested in that. So they should contact them and talk to them. Oh, thank you. Um, a second question and last question is, indigent homeowners, is there a special program from FEMA uh, regarding uh, tree removal? Because I have quite a few seniors that just really can't afford to pay thousands of dollars in the trees are still on their house and in their yards. And well, uh, what we recommend for senior or um, uh, folks that have mobility issues that want to clean out the yard to uh, enroll in the, um, what's the name of the program? Crisis Cleanup. Crisiscleanup.org. And crisiscleanup.org, what it does, it, it captures the needs uh, within the community and what they do is they serve as a clearinghouse for a lot of faith-based nonprofit organizations that go out into the community. They will contact them. They will make an assessment to make sure that that household meets the requirement. They do an inspection of what type of work needs to be done, uh, clearing out debris, fixing a fence, or what have you. And then the second day, they actually send out a crew to, uh, to do the work on that site. Thank you. That's great information. Okay. And I also suggest that, um, and we'll ask, uh, if it's not already up there, I haven't looked, but if we could add to a link to our webpage to c hook customers up with the FEMA Individual Assistance Program, and there may be some opportunities there. I, I have to be honest, it's not one of the large manuals I've ever read. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have there. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stewart. Um, let me say, first of all, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Manny. Um, I'm just so impressed with the work that y'all did. And, of course, Mayor, thank you for your leadership as well during this process. Um, you and I have talked, and I want to make sure my, uh, that, that, that everybody hears the same message. There have been several people going through neighborhoods saying that they are FEMA contractors, uh, that they're doing work on FEMA, and FEMA's given them certain guidelines, and those types of things. We, we simply don't have anybody who's a FEMA contractor coming through the area, as far as I'm concerned. Is that correct? They're all working for us. Calling themselves a FEMA contractor might be a slang or shorthand term, but the company's names are DRC Emergency Services, Ashbrick Environmental, and Crowder Gulf LLC. And so they should, if they ask the name of the company, then it should be one of those three. Otherwise, I'm not sure what they're doing. FEMA does not directly contract with companies to do this. They, cities do that. We pay for their services. FEMA will reimburse us if we follow their rules properly so many months later. I've had at least two or three large tree, you know, I'd say victims if you want to call it that, say that they have been there and that FEMA has FEMA's been there and that they can't haul it off and they have to put it on the side of the road and this this whole story and I and and I know we're getting the message out as quick as we can but I want to make sure that that all of us understand that we, we've, we've set some reserve money set aside so we can go ahead and do this work and then we're going to go back and using FEMA guidelines then apply for FEMA money to, as a reimburse to, to us, is that correct? Yes, sir, to reimburse us. I have heard that there are some contractors who work in, the, in somebody's backyard 
take down a, a damaged tree, cut it up, and then they will put it at the curb and tell people that we can't, according to FEMA rules, take it away. Uh, that is totally untrue. Uh, I toned that down from when the last time I answered that question. It is not right. It is wrong. <laughs> it is untrue. They are totally welcome to take it away. If they cut up a tree from the backyard and place it on the curb, it has to wait along with the rest of the neighborhood. If, you're, if a customer is paying somebody to do tree work on their property, ask them for the price to remove it all. That way they won't have to wait until we can get to that neighborhood. The luck of the draw might be real quickly, but the scope of this and the difficulties the contractors are having finding willing qualified subs, I don't bet on real quickly, and they shouldn't deceive people that way. Um, on the uh, vendors that are out there, they should be still have a, a permit from the city of Orlando or a license from the city of Orlando to work inside the city, correct? With the exception of the ones you've mentioned here? I think the proper name is a business tax certificate. Yes, business tax receipt. And it should be somewhere in s central Florida to do business in the city? I think. I, I'm not sure that we're jurisdictional dead jurisdictional specific, right, Kyle? If you have an Orange County business tax certificate, you BTR, can do business? You need a BTR to do work inside the city of Orlando. You also need a BTR to do work inside uh, unincorporated Orange County. If you're inside the city, you need both. But you certainly need one from us if you're conducting business with inside the city of Orlando. Thank you. So I consumers should. can call us to confirm that information, I guess. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yes, but Commissioner, I'd say just one thing. We should never hold that out as a certificate of competency. That's a, a the problem that occurred after Charlie is that contractors went around to folks and said, hey, look, I have this. At the time, it was called an occupational license or an occupational certificate. And so people got the impression, the misimpression, that we were somehow vouching for their ability to do work correctly. Um, and the legislature after that um, required local governments to change the name of that to the business tax receipt so it was less susceptible to being misrepresented as a sort of certificate of competency. Yeah. Thank if, you. If I can add, Commissioner, that as those contractors working for us, that somebody occasionally will call a FEMA contractor, Ashbridge, et cetera, they're being monitored by a company that we pay to do that, which is a FEMA rule. So it is not, customers should not be. Uh, concerned or off put by somebody in a vest very much like the one I was wearing a few moments ago walking along or sitting in a car behind them following them as they pick up there to make sure that they're following the rules and not doing anything untoward that perhaps once upon a time somebody may have done right and the last quick question is about wires uh, one of the challenges we always have and I think probably in our after action report we'll have to come up with a little bit better way to do it but there is the issue of a down tree with wires in it and the question is are they low voltage high voltage how do you confirm the information and I think we we've addressed some of those issues uh, I know that talk with Kevin and talk with Byron about that um, but I want to tell you how much I appreciate you taking the, the initiative to to reach out uh, when you're out there cleaning debris not just clean, cutting up the um, uh, the trees, but also removing the debris. I appreciate you taking initiative for that. And this is a message that hopefully our customers can pick up from this too, is that if there is a wire of any kind in your brush out front, the contractors will stop. City crews will stop. We may think it's a cable wire and that may only shock us to the degree that a, a cow fence, electric cow fence shocks us, but like it's not worth somebody <laughs> taking, risking their life. And so even a dead wire is dang, it will, will stop that process. And so we've bumped across ones that we believe have, through a process of elimination are AT&T phone wires. One of the best ways to help with that is if the customer calls them because I attempted to intercede this morning and I needed to give them my phone number that associated with the area of a complaint. Their automated system would not, yes. not let me pass. The good news was I exercised my dad's sailor vocabulary mm -hmm. in the office with the door closed and then I calmed down when I left and didn't use bad words again. If I have to put money in a jar, I could buy lunch for a few folks. It was very frustrating. But the customer can do it. When I report a power outage, I can type in my phone number or it asks me for the phone number. So that is helpful because then to report to whoever it is. Mm -hmm. In the case of the customer I spoke to this morning and. Um, I think it was on Clayton Street, or the customer, oh, you see, was able to identify that it wasn't a power wire, but we, our contractor still won't touch it, and I can't blame them. Yeah, I, it I still hurts. I agree. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you for being responsive and thank you for the crews that have done the work uh, that I've seen. It's been really yeoman's work. And I know we got more to do, but I think we've been very responsive and I appreciate that. My biggest labor relation issue so far has been forcing them to take one day off this weekend. Dedicated crew. Commissioner Hill was wondering why you were looking at me when you mentioned the electric cattle fence. But it's because oh. Mike and I went to the same high school and it happens to be Osceola. Yeah. Cows. And Kyle was not far away from there. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Mayor. <laughs> thank you. All right, Commissioner Sheehan. No, thank you. And uh, first, Manny, I'd like to thank you. I, um, I was working for the state with Andrew, and I remember when we had to institute the emergency services functions because we really didn't have a way to even respond at that time. Right. And to see that replicated, because I worked for the state, to see how all the municipalities, but especially how you have, mm -hmm. have done that, it's, it's really impressive. Thank and you. thank you. I know you, you all trained for this, and there's a reason you trained for that. And, and uh, I also want to thank all the city employees who came in to volunteer their time, um, many of whom who, who had damaged their own homes. And you know, Julia's house was flooded. I, you know, thank you all for, you know, people talk about government employees like we're some kind of a problem until they need us. Right. And they don't realize that a lot of the city employees had damage to their own homes as well, and they were still out helping people. So I always want to thank all of you who left your homes during the hurricane to help others. And even though there's a lot of complaining going on, I had to leave on Friday because I was getting so angry. I was getting to the point, Mike, where I was about to use some foul words myself because it just got to the point where, you know, you know, you get to a point where you expect people to be reasonable and rational, and not always like that. But, um, but I just want to thank you all for that, and um, and Mike, especially your your guys too. Um, I know that they've been out working so hard. And please leave my piles alone, because <laughs> they've been so. They came out and picked me up. I'm like, don't. I actually went and you know, I had more luckily to replace it. But please don't pick me up. I want to be picked up last. Um, you want to be talked about. They're so nice, though. I mean, I, I know those guys on my routes, and they're lovely people. But please don't pick me up um, until everybody else is picked up. Not but showing preference. They're running, <laughs> they're running the route the way they always run the route, and then yeah. the next time they run it backwards to give the people at the back end a chance. Well, thank you so very luck much. Of the draw, man. But it, it, I, I'm glad I got the luck of the draw. But I believe me, I had plenty. Luckily, the only good thing about it was I had so much damage at my house, I was able to replace it. But uh, what, uh, something that a lot of people are asking me now, Mike, are about the, um, about the dump fees, the drop-offs. Um, do they have to pay the dump fees? Because I have people that are willing to volunteer to help their neighbors, but they're not willing to pay the, the extra fees if there's a lot of yard waste. So is there an, is there, and, if, and if they are charging, is there some way that we can you know, do a reimbursement or something like that to encourage people to do so? I have not gone, I live just outside of Orange County, so I can't okay. go to an Orange County dis, uh, public drop-off, but there should not be a charge for that. Okay. I do not believe there is. They might be a charge if you went to the landfill itself, and I do not know if those are being waived or not, but there are many places closer for vegetative debris in particular than taking it all the way to the end of Young Prine Road. For example, there's one at the Barnett um, Park, which is at the edge of uh, the city fairgrounds. Yeah. There's also one just a little bit east of Inglewood, on Curry, off of, right off of Curry Ford, before you get to the landfill. Can you verify that and can we put it on the website? Because that's the one thing that I've heard people say is like, gee, you know, we, we, we're willing to help pick up and I'm willing to help my neighbors, but I don't want to have a $100 bill when I get to the dump because I've got so much tonnage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do encourage them to take their neighbor with them. With If you load up your truck and trailer, if you have a landscaping trailer mm -hmm. and you load it up, and if they were taking your debris, if you could go, because the county is required by FEMA regulations to verify the residency of where the debris came from. Just to be clear, nobody's picking up my debris. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it, it'd no. be, um, be worth a short ride. Well, I think they're that. picking up for elderly neighbors and stuff like that, and you know, I I don't know how we can do that, but I think there needs to be some um, way to be able to to help help them without having to drag their elderly neighbor to the dump with them. So I will verify, and we'll make sure that our link to the count because if you pick Irma Recovery on the city's main webpage, then it goes to a, a long page which includes the county the county for everybody in the county public drop-off sites and we'll make sure that those are in fact free as they should be and that that says so clearly there yeah and and like you I had the same problem people were calling me about different companies and it's like if you don't have an account with that company you can't get to a customer service representative so again you know I mean it might be good for us to have contact information for those companies um, 
just because people are asking about all the different companies and I don't have an account with them. And they, the first thing they do is ask your account number and you can't go any further. So, yeah, again, that would be, that would be helpful moving forward. That's a, I guess that's more of a Manny. Well, and that is something that we recognize in our after action reports. We are much better at coordinating with utilities than we were after Charlie. Yeah. Now we'll continue to work on those other issues as well. Every yeah. time we learn. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I know that OUC hung, I mean, they had to go around some of the really bad damage, and they re went ahead and rehung the wires, and they left the dead wires around some of the debris. In, 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 and now you're saying you're picking it up. How are you supposed to know if it's live or not? So if they, do we need to come up with some kind of a way or a system to identify that? Because I know in my district we had some where power lines were wrapped around trees and poles, and maybe we need to have the power company tag it somehow so that the, you will know that that's not live anymore because I know Illinois Street, they, had to, they, they rehung the wires, but they left the big tree with the wires wrapped around it. So there, there needs to be a way to, to mark that so that you all know it's not live. I think the next step is for the Utility Commission line crews to come out and extract those. Oh, they're going to extract them? Yes. Uh, that's okay. my understanding of how that works, but we do need to work on that. There yeah. are still more than a handful of opportunity of situations where some wire is in there. Yeah. I think they're able to extract their own, and they do have a, a tag out system. Okay. I've never seen them wrapped around like this. I mean, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was just the fact that we had a lot of tornadoes and stuff, but I, I've never seen them like this where they were actually wrapped around a, a big tree. It's crazy. So. I after Charlie, they came, the Utility Commission in particular came and extracted the wire from the tree. So sometimes we could cut it up and push it out of the way once it was disconnected. Yeah. Then, at, at a late, then they went on to their next problem mm -hmm. until they did restoration and then they came back. So let me see if that's still the correct process. Okay, thank you. And again, thank you very much. I mean, I know they're working cool. very hard. And, and believe me, I have been defending you on social media. People have been complaining. And, and I'm like, if, if your biggest problem is a pile of yard waste, consider yourself lucky because there's a lot of folks in my district who are, who are suffering, lost their homes, can't even get up their driveways right now. So if yard waste is your biggest problem, thank God, because there's a lot of folks who are really been seriously impacted. And um, I live over by Lou Gardens, and I, I know I heard the freight train there had to have been a tornado and I know that Lou Gardens is just absolutely destroyed and poor Robert I mean I can't imagine what he's going through right now because I've never seen you know this I, I, I think I've, I've been on the council for 17 years I've never seen anything like the damage we had on this one I've met with the uh, Lou Gardens staff and that will become what's called a small project a FEMA small project they've already done a great deal of damage assessment to know what things are what things need to be removed, what things, and the techniques to do it. We'll put together a package and get on that as quick as we can. It, it needs to be bid separately, but they've got a plan of action. They've implemented it already. Oh, that's interesting. Because they had so much damage, are they able to get it a separate de delineation then? Well, the, the true botanical gardens part is very different. The normal oh, okay. techniques of driving a tractor through, cutting, oh, yeah. Yeah. dropping a tree, cutting it into pieces and having a tractor pick it up doesn't work there. Right. So they'll use cranes and, and much more hand work and things that wouldn't normally be allowed. So that's what we did after Charlie was we created a special, uh, a small project and they did the work there. They do have a few issues that are um, very pressing on the Lou Museum. Yeah and that those are being addressed right now. They've contracted, contacted the city's tree service contractors to get immediate assistance. In a few weeks, we should be able to get a contractor in to do specialized work in Lou Gardens and help restore it to the way it was as best we can so that Robert can introduce it as the beautiful Lou Gardens again. As, as best we can, because yep. there were some 100-year hickories and things like that that were just that are just absolutely um unreplaceable and 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 uh i i had forgotten or be remiss to not thank andy kitsley in the parks department because they actually went out proactively in neighborhoods and tried to do a lot of pruning that week before but this was just so catastrophic even pruning wasn't going to help with some of these i mean there were trees that fell that didn't even have any I mean, they weren't even rotten they were just huge oaks that didn't even have any rotten spots they just fell it was just, it was just the, the, the size, mass, and scale of the storm. But I thank Andy and his folks as well for, yes. for working so hard. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Hill. 
I was just uh, following up on a question, uh, well, a uh, comment of Commissioner uh, Stewart about uh, signage and magnetics. Uh, will the contractors, the primes, be able to provide those subs with some type of magnetic uh, uh, signage so that our citizens can know that they are legitimate? On the driver's side of the truck, at the beginning of the body, will be a placard about almost two foot square, adhesive, okay. not magnetic. And it will say the uh, sign number of the truck for whoever their major prime contractor is. So Ashbrit has a placard. It says Ashbrit Environmental at the top. They've given it a number, 221, and it's measurements. And then there's a small QR code mm -hmm. that the monitoring firm uses. But there is a placard about yay big put on the body just a little bit behind the cab only on the driver's side. So you can see that to know that that is a truck working for one of our prime contractors. They'll are, all have a placard like that. Are we able, since City they trucks would, have them too, I'm since sorry. Since they wouldn't know the primes, but they know the city of Orlando, I don't know legally, are we able to put our little seal underneath that, on that placard so they know that they're working for the city? Um, or would that be uh, something to do with Yeah, this? I'm not sure how that, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a lot of little seals to do it, even if it was commonly acceptable. We don't happen to have, and we don't want to slow them up for that. Yeah. But it is one of three big companies, and there is a placard on there, and it does say that they're working in Orlando. Our, I think some of the truck numbers start with O-R-L, and then a number after that. That's fine. Yeah. And if they're in doubt about a specific location, they're welcome to contact our office. Good, Commissioner. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you, you, Manny. I know you got a lot to do in the mm -hmm. next month or so. So um, thank the employees from City Council for everything they're doing. And Manny, uh, pass thanks on to all your crew too, and everybody else. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and as we continue to recover from Irma and do our part on the restoration, we also want to be mindful and recognize those that not only were impacted in Texas prior to that, but that yeah. were impacted by the earthquake in Mexico and um, Hurricane Maria. I know, Manny, you have family in Puerto Rico and many of our other city employees have family that are still in Puerto Rico and may or may not have heard from them. Um, my understanding is that the island has no power whatsoever and that it'll be as long as six months before power is fully restored there. So we hope your families and friends are safe in Puerto Rico. City staff has been working with the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration to see how we can help. And the way we can right now is by collecting donations of emergency supplies, such as diapers and cleaning supplies. And they have two locations for drop off in Central Florida. And they're listed on cityoforlando.net. We have both fire and police ready if uh, called upon to be dispatched to Puerto Rico as we responded to Texas. Um, if we get the call through the appropriate channels, we are queued up and ready to send uh, police or search and rescue, um, whatever um, we're called upon to do. I assume Commissioner Ortiz will have a little bit more on that issue. Um, on the more mundane, uh, State of the City is on October the 11th at 3.30 at Ace Cafe. Um, we're just now starting to work on that now that we have come up for a little bit of air from everything that we've been doing related to Hurricane Irma. And um, that is the address that is in partnership with the Downtown Orlando Partnership. You can get tickets at visitdoporlando.com. And again, that's going to be at Ace Cafe, and uh, there'll be a lot more about Ace Cafe and some of the newer things that have happened in downtown Orlando in the last year during that presentation. Also, the Veterans Advisory Council will host the official POW MIA recognition ceremony on September 27th. Uh, it's a Wednesday at 11 o'clock in City Hall Rotunda, and the event serves to honor our U.S. military prisoners of war and those still missing in action with a symbolic setting at a table conducted by UCS AFR ROTC Detachment 159. And uh, we have a really great 
um, keynote speaker this year for that event, and it's uh, Police Chief John Mina from the city of Orlando. <laughs> And then I just want to mention one item of note from um, the council agenda and under FPR, there are a whole bunch of employment contracts and those are the agreements related to staff who help manage the after school all stars and the Paramore kids zone, which are highly productive programs for the city of Orlando. With that, we're going to move on to the consent agenda and the consent agenda is a uh, number of items that are acted upon through a single vote of council. Um, to give each of the members of council an opportunity to comment on those items and or update you on important things that are happening in their district. We rotate the order that we do that and today Commissioner Tony Ortiz is going to kick us off. Thank you Mayor. Um, first of all I want to echo your commendations to all our departments. They have done an excellent, excellent job. Everybody has come together in such a way. But I have a special commendation in particular to the Orlando Utilities Commission. Dear Lord, we would not be here if it wasn't because of the extreme great job these guys have done. These guys have been Johnny on the spot. They have really come out. I was out there. I, what I was doing is I was visiting the homes of those who were disabled or, or were in respirators, all the different kind of things. I'm waiting for all you see in front of their houses. And these people were just showing up, their brigades. I mean. For three or four days, these guys were just tirelessly working out there, and I know that our city today is in the state that it is because of the way these guys, in addition to, of course, our staff and everybody, police department and uh, fire department, but we all depend so much on OUC, so if you see one of those guys out there, please give him a hand because they did a great, great job, and I, I was... Uh, in comparing to other areas of uh, Florida and, and the state, when we, uh, I just came back from a meeting with the Florida League of Cities and we were comparing notes and we we're talking about how their services were being rendered and whatnot, and of course by far OUC Excel. so kudos to them. Uh, in addition, I'd also like to recognize and commend all our neighborhood leaders who came out selflessly and made themselves available to help our community. Without all of you, none of, none of uh, this would have been possible. And I want to thank uh, District 2. I know that I'm pretty sure in the other districts the same thing happened, the community coming together. I know the commissioners were out there, the mayor. Um, this was such a great effort. And, and indeed, I'm so proud of being part of this great city, as I keep calling it, the epicenter of the world. We do know how to do things as a community. We do know care about each other. Now here comes the sad part. Uh, I please ask each and every one of you to keep our people from Puerto Rico and Mexico in your prayers. These are terrible times for Puerto Rico when you are out of power, out of no water, no, no power, uh, no communication whatsoever, uh, depletion of, of food and water. I mean, and our families, bits and pieces that we can get through WhatsApp applications like those, there's only one carrier in Puerto Rico is called Clara that has been the one who has been able to allow us to communicate through Wi-Fi or not here and there, not all the time, it's not consistent. And when I hear the claim of our families crying for food mm. and for water, it's, just, it's not easy. So please, please, please help us out. These are difficult times. I want to thank our governor, Governor Rick Scott, I want to thank our mayor, Mayor Dyer. Uh, Byron Brooks, can say enough. You've been receiving my calls Saturday and Sunday. I want to thank uh, Mr. Frank Ropenbacker, President of Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, Phil Brown, the CEO, uh, the Director of the Office of Profit in Washington, the Secretary of State in Puerto Rico, Manny, can say enough about how you've worked, our chiefs, uh, Colonel Wilson Arisa, with the uh, Veterans Administration. We are all standing by for this uh, letter coming from, or this, uh, the, the assign, assignation of, of the uh, governor in order for us to be able to deploy our people, which as the mayor said eloquently, is all ready to go. Uh, please keep us on your prayers. Please keep our families. Uh, people are desperate in Mexico. and People are desperate in Puerto Rico right now. Nothing worse.
and listen to the voice of, of those you love, desperately claiming for, mm -hmm. for food, water, and, uh, and help. Mm -hmm. So please keep us, keep us on your prayers. Uh, on September 19th, we had our first class for Folk Government Academy. I've always said that the rights of community, of community leaders begin with academics. So I'd like to congratulate 57 committed members of our Central Florida region who have come together to be part of our 7th Government Academy. Towards the end of the courses, these individuals will be informed and prepared to be active participants within our government and communities. I'd also like to invite all of you to a Florida abolitionist event this Thursday, September 28th at 10 a.m. on our city hall rotunda. Mayor, I know you're going to be there, and commissioners. Uh, as we come together to commit to ending human trafficking, over 60,000 people in this country are victims to this senseless crime. So please show your support and get involved. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stewart. Thank you, Mayor, and, uh, and thank you, Tony. Um, whatever we can do, uh, as I've shared with you, um, just keep me posted and ready to move. Um, let me mention a couple of things. One is our condolences to uh, uh, the, those uh, friends and family of uh, Andre Cudlax. Um, he's a very uh, uh, important, influential leader in our community, um, and especially in the College Park area. So I want to say um, a... Um, had a wonderful um, uh, celebration of her life last week, uh, and it was uh, uh, we're going to miss her a lot in our community. I just want to make sure that that uh, we all step up and and help take her place as she's gone. Um, also, want to mention I think uh, um, uh, Mike mentioned earlier, but we're going to have a cleanup at Lou Gardens uh, this Saturday, uh, from nine I think no, from eight to twelve. Uh, at um, uh, on September 30th, uh, we need 100 volunteers to kind of get things cleared up so we can get through the through the uh, uh, the garden. Uh, and um, I appreciate anybody can help step up, step up and do that. Also, want to say a special thanks to Christ City Church and Edgewater High School for pick, pitching in and helping clean up our parks. And I think uh, Pastor Zach is gone, but also Summit has helped out as well. So I appreciate that. On some other items, National Night Out is almost here. As I imagine with all the what's going on with Irma and everything else, we, we have forgotten that we have other things that are moving forward. And National Night Out is one of those things that we have has come up next Tuesday. Um, check out the OPD's website uh, for information about a gathering near you. And then the other thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, even in the fact of, of Irma coming through and we have done a wonderful job getting our amenities back up, there's some things that are coming up. Um, I want to make sure that we're getting back to normal as soon as we can and uh, up the Manello Museum um, uh, family, uh, Free Family Fun Day is October 8th. I want to make sure you all can get there as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, Mayor, that's all that I have today. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll move to Commissioner Sheehan. Uh, thank you, Mayor Dyer. And um, when the when the power went out at, at my house, I actually had a weather radio that I had bought many years ago, and I'm so glad that I had it because you know I didn't know what was going on. Once you lo once you lose TV and power, you have no idea. And and I had forgotten that we had that. Um, we had purchased them for the neighborhood watches and presidents of the neighborhood associations, and they reminded me that they had them, and that's how they got to the storm. And I'd just like to remind everybody, if you don't have a weather radio, it's just really, really important, especially if to know what's going on. Because like I say, I was right next to Lou Gardens where there was tornadoes, and that way I knew it was what was actually going on. But it's, it's, it's terrifying to be in the dark, but it's worse if you don't know what's happening. So again, if you don't have a weather radio, it's a very good investment, especially, you know, we're so reliant upon internet and upon television but you never know when that's going to go out and I also am so thankful for a lot of the radio stations who also were running the National Weather Service information during that time so that so that people could get so that people could get information and um, and Roseanne Harrington actually called me at home to let me know when the neighborhoods were coming up and that's mm -hmm. that service above and beyond so thank you Roseanne and OUC for letting us know what neighborhoods were still out so we would know where to where to deliver ice and and where people needed help 
help. And I also want to thank Officer Eddie Rosado. Um, a chainsaw became a legitimate office expense, and Officer Rosado actually went out and helped clear five different streets. And I think more than that, actually, by the time uh, the end of the day, day uh, throughout the week that he was out there. And I also want to thank my aide, Bill Stevens. We had some seniors at Canaret who were trying desperately to get power, and he was helping me deliver ice. And we had a bunch of kids from the neighborhood in Delaney Park, and they were delivering ice to seniors up 15 flights of stairs. So that's the kind of people that live in our community. And I just want to thank those kids in Delaney Park and Wadeview Park who came out to help the senior citizens at, at, at Canaret because they didn't have power. You know, a lot of folks were fussing them. But they could, you know, if you're a senior citizen and you can't use the elevator and you can't get out, that's a, that's a big deal. So, again, I want to thank Bill for helping them getting their power to get their power restored. And Commissioner Ortiz, thank you for helping us put this in perspective um, because it could have been a lot worse and a lot of people are upset and about yard waste. And we have pe you, you, there are people who, here who have family members who have passed away. And there are people here in this country who, who are trying to do anything they can to help their, their family members who are starving. So again, I, I, I know people say, why are you being so mean? It's not that I'm being mean. I, we need to put it in perspective, and we need to be willing to help others. And if you don't have food and water, I mean, my God, that's just, those are just the basics. So whatever we can do, um, you know, this might be a little bit different because we usually we, we um, encourage people to give money. But you know, we, we might have to send water and food because of the fact that it's an island. So, in, 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 you know, again, whatever we can do to, to help out. And Commissioner Stewart talked about, but the Lou Gardens cleanup is on September 30th, Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, yes, Commissioner, I will be there at 8 a.m. I will get up early because that's, you know, that's, that's an important part of my there. life, Lou Gardens. So I'll, I'll see you there. And, uh, again, thank to all the city employees, city crews, everyone who's still out there. And, and uh, I know there's been some criticisms, and I think that they're very unfair because I know how much you all work. I know how hard you all work, and I know how dedicated you are. And uh, I'll, I'll be out there defending you. Even if they want to yell at me, that's fine with me. Um, but thank you for everything that you did. You all did an amazing job in helping others. And you don't do this for the money. We don't, we don't pay much here at the city of Orlando, but you all work so hard, and I want to thank you for, for helping others. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Move to Commissioner Hill. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to just echo what everyone here uh, on the DAS stated about the efforts of uh, Orlando Fire Department, OPD, uh, all the way from our uh, CAO Byron Brooks, your leadership, Mayor, uh, and every auxiliary department in this city. Uh, I, I tell you, even what I've found is even during horrific or tragic times that this city, this city rise to a level of just amaze, amazement uh, for the world to see, uh, neighbors helping neighbors, uh, just people stepping up to the plate that did not have lights, mm -hmm. that, that just was going through terrible times themselves, but taking care of one another. So I just thank you all, uh, even to the, to the public. Uh, strangers coming up and calling and asking what can they do to assist those in, in uh, all of our districts, I do believe. Uh, so uh, in those efforts, when we talk about uh, Hurricane Irma relief uh, on that Tuesday following the hurricane, uh, just everyday citizens uh, uh, contacted me via social media because many of the uh, folks, that's all they had was their cell phones to try to reach out. and. And staff did do, I think Manny, he's gone, but they did an amazing job by hourly just putting out that social media information for us to share uh, with our constituents. And uh, uh, that's how many of our citizens kept abreast what was going on because they did not have their utilities. Uh, I had folks going out to I purchase a chainsaw also <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had uh, church, the faith-based community, just go out throughout District 5. We were looking for seniors, Toolbox for Life. Uh, it was a uh, nonprofit that came out and started cutting down trees and removing uh, debris and putting it on the side of the road. It was So uh, we did that for three days, just making sure that many of our seniors could uh, come out their homes. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone for that. And that following day, which was that Wednesday, uh, the city of Orlando, uh, through their efforts with Wawa, I believe, we were able to receive ice. 
and uh, Orlando Magic uh, stepped up and also uh, contributed another 500 bags of ice to uh, District 5. And we went out to the Northwest Center and the Salvation Army came out and gave out uh, sandwiches and Cox Radio came out and just played music because people in that uh, corner there, in the Mercer Drive corner, uh, were without uh, utilities uh, for like almost four days at that point. And uh, they didn't have uh, any food. The food had gone by it. So we were able to uh, give out food and give out ice, uh, even just a necessity like that. You would think uh, people, we don't treasure that ice, but it was, it was worth a million dollars. It was priceless. So over a 1,000 bags of ice was given out there at the Northwest Center. The mayor uh, and many of city staff was out there directing traffic. It was very, very humid and hot. And I just want to thank you all for coming in, giving a, a helping hand, Brooke and Lillian, for being out there in the trenches uh, with your hard caps on. And it was not a political stunning going on. A posturing going on that day. It was true sweat equity in those trenches throughout every district, I believe, that day in the city of Orlando, where we were helping, our, our neighbors was helping each other, and we were helping the community. Um, also, uh, that following day, i like to thank uh, Orange County Commissioner Victoria Sipling for partnering with myself and Majestic Life Church, where through Second Harvest, we were able to distribute over uh, 800 meals to families uh, with basic food kits, uh, water, bug spray, and tarp. So uh, the Orange County Fire Department uh, assisted with that effort, and I'd like to thank them. That evening, uh, the church, the faith-based community, uh, community came out. Uh, Pastor Johnny and Rena Lingo went over to uh, the Rock Lake Community Center where utilities were still allowed, and they helped about 75 uh, seniors and, and vulnerable uh, families with hot spaghetti meals and Olive Garden um, donated some of that nice salad that they make over there. So that was really nice with their breadsticks. And I also uh, I'm very thankful for the uh, uh, items that are on the CRA uh, when we talk about Seniors First, which plays a vital role in uh, over 18, I think, uh, senior living complexes here in the downtown in District 5 and District 6, uh, throughout the city actually, uh, by making sure that our seniors can maintain their independence by picking them up and providing them transportation to the grocery stores, uh, to senior outings, uh, and also uh, many times to some of their doctor's appointments. So I'd like to thank uh, CRA Director Walter uh, Chapman and our board, CRA board, uh, for assisting us with these funds, but more so the uh, commission here for approving uh, this very needed uh, uh, funds. And Sun Life Grocery, I'm glad to see that being on the list for being uh, getting some stabilization funding there in the heart of Paramore, which have been there uh, at least 50 years that I know of, uh, providing uh, uh, groceries there to those folks. But uh, they've stood the test of time. And what I'm really excited about is with our UCF and Valencia coming to that corner, Mayor and Commission, uh, with the uh, funds that we're going to give to uh, Sun Life Groceries to uh, put in, in a new roof in a parking lot that now this neighborhood store that have stood the test of times will now see all this new revenue coming in because I do believe that grocery store is going to be the hub of where these students can walk to get fresh uh, produce, fruits, uh, meats, and all the things to maintain their uh, lives there on campus and all the other adequate affordable housing that's going on in the Paramore uh, community right now. And of course, as the mayor mentioned, uh, there's multiple contracts on our uh, agenda today when it comes to after school all stars and PKZ jobs. The mayor mentioned that that was one of our uh, that he uh, that he uh, envisioned, and I'm just uh, excited and happy to be a part of it to continue uh, that great work that he started when it comes to the PKZ. 
and it has evolved, I, I would like to say, Mayor and Council, from a program. This now, uh, this program is a program that is a support system that sustains families from incubator to career in their own, uh, and also create uh, youth jobs and, and uh, during high school and thereafter. They have these kids and families have uh, advocates in school. They have life coaches that go out to the schools with them every day and make sure that they are that liaison between the household to education, which I do believe is the greatest equalizer. And there's also uh, uh, crime prevention. Uh, many times when we live in urban communities, if a child or a young adult don't have a, a job, we know what the other uh, alternative is, uh, uh, Chief Mina, and that's the streets. And uh, these type of uh, this, these type of pro opportunities and job opportunities keep our children from out the grave and out of prison. So I see this as a lifeline, uh, Mayor, more so than a program. So with that being said, uh, I just um, just uh, uh, in prayer for Puerto Rico. My little poppy, uh, which is my grandson, has a grandmother and uncles and aunties over there, and they are uh, suffering and also without food and, and almost water. So uh, from a uh, uh, personal standpoint, I feel your pain also, Commissioner Ortiz, and uh, I, I, I'm almost certain I don't have the numbers, but if I recall, Mayor and Council, that the Puerto Rican community is one of the fastest growing communities here in the central Florida and especially here in the city of Orlando. So uh, these are our sisters and brothers that's here in Orlando that have families back home that's suffering and we stand with you and whatever I can do also, uh, I'm available. The numbers are by far in, in terms of not just Hispanic but specifically Puerto Rican residents here in central Florida, they outnumber the number of Puerto Ricans that live in San Juan now. Yep. Okay, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Ings, we've kind of made it a policy that if you're on the phone, we <laughs> skip over. And Commissioner Ortiz reminded me that he didn't yeah. have the opportunity to do remarks when he was on the phone. So until we upgrade the technology, if you can save yours for the next meeting, that would be great. Thanks. Hey, Mayor, I just want you to know that your cream time looks good. And I'm streaming live, actually, <laughs> Well, we made out that my tie looks great and couldn't <laughs> understand the rest of it, Commissioner, yeah, but right. we know you're there. Thanks. All right. Commissioner Gray. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm not sure I can add much more to what's already been said, so I will uh, also echo previous comments and, and offer my thanks to everybody uh, here on the staff as well as our neighbors who helped neighbors. So that, that was quite rewarding. I will say one thanks real quick. Uh, Pre-Irma, we we're able to uh, to finally realize our vision of opening two new opening starting construction on two new parks in the southeast, mm -hmm. and I want to thank certainly our staff, folks at Parks and Rec were huge in getting this started, and uh, as well as the mayor and Commissioner Ortiz who came out for the groundbreaking. So good news, we've got some parks coming to uh, Lake Nona, so we're excited about that. Uh, and with that, I will make a motion to approve Second. the consent agenda. Motion on the consent agenda by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Ortiz. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, and so the motion carries. That was a pretty mucky day, wasn't it, Commissioner? It, it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. That, I believe, hold on, let me look at my agenda here. Okay, that brings us to the CRA. So we will, without objection, recess the city council meeting. We will adjourn, we'll convene the CRA meeting. Uh, let's take the first two items, which are minutes. So number one is the minutes from the July 26th advisory board meeting. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. All in favor indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion. Carries. Second is approving CRA minutes from July 24th. Motion. So, so moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill. Second by Commissioner Sheehan. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. CRA minutes August 8th. So, 
Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Hill. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Number four, um, Thomas. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Item number four is uh, approving a homeless outreach funding agreement. Um, as you were for the last few years, the CRA has partnered with the health care for the homeless as well as the Homeless Services Network to provide um, homeless outreach coordinators uh, by two uh, specialists in the downtown CRA area. Uh, we, the CRA uh, looks forward to continuing that relationship. This is the annual agreement coming before you. The costs remain uh, essentially unchanged from last year, just over 106000 for the entire agreement, of which the CRA is responsible for just over $61,000 uh, of. And um, uh, the CRA advisory board has recommended approval. And if there is, if there are no questions or without objection, staff is requesting approval of the Homeless Outreach Funding Agreement for a period of 12 months, subject to review and approval by the city attorney's office and authorization for the chair and executive director to execute such agreement. Move approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Stewart. Mayor. Commissioner Stewart. Yeah, I'd just like to um, um, go on record to make sure that we've done the research about whether there's any conflict of interest that I have, and we've determined that none of that funding comes to the Christian Service Center, center as a function of as, as direct staff. And I want to make sure that we are on the same page. I want to go on record to make that sure that we've researched it. That is correct, This does not yes, come sir. in conflict with us. Yes, yes, Commissioner, you're correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number five, Thomas. All right, number five is the Seniors First Agreement the Commissioner Hill just mentioned. Uh, this agreement, of course, for fiscal year 2000. 16, 17, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, senior trans uh, transports the residents of 11 downtown senior housing complexes, uh, and that agreement expires, of course, at September 30th of this year. Again, the amount remains unchanged from prior years uh, at just over $45,846. Siri Advisory Board recommends approval, and staff is re requesting approval. Uh, Motion approved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number six. Item number six is the Downtown Orlando Incorporated, which is doing business as the Downtown Orlando Partnership, or DOP, uh, annual funding agreement. Again, uh, the DOP um, uh, takes, handles certain various activities related to their mission of uh, support and enhancement of downtown businesses, and the CRA desires to, to continue to, in that relationship with them. Um, as with the others, this agreement remains at um, an amount that is unchanged at $25,000 uh, for the year. Again, the CRA Advisory Board has recommended approval, and staff is requesting uh, approval of that agreement and authorization for the Chair and, their, and the Executive Director to execute same. Second. Second. Would approve. Motion by Commissioner Hills, second by Commissioner Stewart. Discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. All right, number seven. Number seven is the fiscal year 2017-18 Downtown Development Board and Community Redevelopment Agency Cost Share Agreement. This annual agreement, of course, uh, outlines the terms under which the DDB and CRA will share administrative costs. Uh, for the fiscal year, and the CRA, uh, CRA Advisory Board, excuse me, has recommended approval, and staff is requesting approval. Move approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Eight. Number eight is the FY 2017-2018 City Services Agreement between the city of Orlando and the Community Redevelopment Agency. The City Services Agreement outlines the terms under which the city will provide administrative and professional support to the CRA in the implementation of, the, of its redevelopment area plan. Again, the CRA Advisory Board recommends approval, and staff is requesting approval. Move approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicates so by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Number nine. Nine. And finally, nine is the Downtown Facade and Building Stabilization Program funding agreement between the CRA and Sun Life Grocery and Market Incorporated. Uh, again, mentioned by 
Commissioner Hill and her comments. Uh, you recall that this, this program provides um, three-year interest-free deferred loans for uh, improvements to facades and stabilization of buildings within the redevelopment uh, area. Sun Life Grocery and Market is applied for assistance under the program at their facility at 211 North Paramore. The funding would be used for uh, a roof, a new roof, a rooftop screen for air conditioning equipment, uh, exterior building lights, as well as a, a roll-up garage door. The program provides uh, a reimbursement up to 50 percent with a not to exceed of $40,000. The applicant's capital investment is approximately $85,000, making them eligible for funding assistance of up to $40,000. The Downtown Facade Grant Review Committee convened um, September 5th and has recommended approval, and staff is recommending approval. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Discussion. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, and so the motion carries. Uh, Thomas, any further business to come before the CRA? Nothing else, Mayor. I would just like to point out, uh, as have others, I don't want to forget about them. Your clean team, your downtown clean team also has really uh, been out there 24 7 since the storm. Uh, we lost 80 trees, but a lot of debris, and that, that, that work continues, and we're happy to be a part of this team. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Then we, the CRA will stand adjourned. We will call to order the Neighborhood Improvement District Board of Directors meeting for the purpose of accepting the minutes of the September 13th Advisory Council um, meeting. Is there a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, so the motion carries and we will adjourn the NID meeting and we will take a three minute recess.
Okay, let's reconvene the city council meeting without objection. We will move to hearings ordinances on second reading. Madam Clerk, it's your show. Ordinance 2017-31, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to the City's Growth Management Plan, GMP, providing the summer 2017 package of GMP amendments pursuant to the expedited state review process, amending the GMP to create future land use element sub-area policy S.12.10, amending the future land use element figure LU-1 relating to commercial uses in the industrial commercial district, deleting and replacing the historic preservation element figure HP-2 relating to local historic landmarks, providing for amendment of the city's growth management plan, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. So Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners, hearing none all in favor of the motion indicates so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number two, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-35, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the city's adopted growth management plan, future land use element, sub-area policy, S.26.5, to increase the floor area ratio for non-residential development within the sub-area policy boundary south of Wallace Road, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ng, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Number three, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-36, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the land development regulations for a portion of the Double Eagle Way Plan Development District, generally located south of Wallace Road and west of Turkey Lake Road and comprised of 0.37 acres of land, more or less, providing an amended development plan for the Plan Development District, providing amended special land development regulations, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and an effective date. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ains, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone from the public like Tesla on this matter? Discussion among commissioners? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number four, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-50, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the city's adopted growth management plan to change the future land use map designation for a portion of approximately 14.63 acres of land generally located west of Narcusi Road, north of Tavistock Lakes Boulevard, and south of Tyson Road, from conservation to urban village in part, and from urban village to conversation conservation in part on the city's official future land use maps, providing for amendment of the city's official future land use maps, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Move to adopt. Second. Good to hear from you, Commissioner Gray. <laughs> um, motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Ortiz. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. All right, Madam Clerk, let's move on to ordinances first read. Ordinance 2017-38, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to the noise ordinance, amending the noise ordinance to clarify definitions and the method of measuring noise, providing grammatical and stylistic updates, providing clarifications relating to the permitting and use of outdoor mechanical loudspeakers and amplifiers, providing for severability, codification, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ortiz, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone for the public by like testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. May none. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Hold on. Hold on. Commissioner Ortiz is <laughs> a little slow, but he would like to speak uh, on this matter. It has been a tough week. Um, I just wish to um, get the particulars of this in, in reference to, because um, I know a while back we had an ordinance for I think it was 25 feet away from uh, a vehicle that was blasting their, their music or so if somebody can come over and explain in more detail what are going to be the changes that we're going to implement. Okay, we'll do that between now and second reading. All right, uh, on favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number two, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-51, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, designating certain land generally located west of Narcusi Road, north of Tavistock Lakes Boulevard, and south of Tyson Road, and comprised of 14.63 acres of land, more or less, as the Plan Development District, providing a development plan and special land development re regulations of the Plan Development District, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. 
Motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 As opposed, motion carries. Number three, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-52, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, annexing to the corporate limits of the city, certainly and generally located south of Hoffner Avenue, east of Conway Road, and west of Kempston Drive, and comprised of 0.713 acres of land, more or less, amending the city's adopted growth management plan to designate the property as office low intensity on the city's official future land use maps, designate the property as the 0-1 uh, low intensity office residential district, along with the aircraft noise and Conway Road special plan overlay districts on the city's official zoning maps, providing for amendment of the city's official future land use and zoning maps, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed and the motion carries. We have previously deleted item number four, so let's move on to number five, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2017-53, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the Columbia Mixed Use Plan Development District, generally located north of Columbia Street, east of Lucerne Terrace, south of West Gore Street, and west of South Orange Avenue, and comprised of five acres of land, more or less, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and an effective date. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. Is anyone from the public white test on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 And so the motion carries, and that concludes the official business of the Orlando City Council for today, September 25th.